Hey folks, I'm Brown Bear. Today I'll be doing a retrospective on Age of Mythology. This will be the first in a four-part series of videos I'll be doing on the Age of Empires series. I'll be covering Age of Empires 1, Age of Empires 2, Age of Mythology, and Age of Empires 3. If you're watching these as they're being released, then you'll have noticed that I did them out of order. This is mostly for practical reasons related to gathering footage. The videos should more or less stand up on their own, so hopefully it doesn't end up mattering too much in the end. Before I get started, let me talk a bit about my background. I started playing Age of Empires with Age of Empires 1, and I started playing online in Age of Empires 2. I played competitively in Age of Mythology, and by the end of Age of Titans was one of the top ranked players in the world. I'm probably best known for my competitive performance in Age of Empires 3. Playing under the handle Parfait, I was the second best player in the world in the 2007 World Cyber Games. About five years ago, I started writing about game design. Over time, I found some modest success talking about strategy games. Most of my recent work has focused on StarCraft II, and I plan to focus on Age of Empires IV when that game is released. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, I'd modestly recommend you give me a follow on social media to keep up with my content. Otherwise, sit back and relax as we take a look back at one of my personal favorite strategy games, Age of Mythology. Age of Mythology was developed by Ensemble Studios and released in 2002 for the PC platform. Its expansion pack, The Titans, was released a year later in 2003. The game was subsequently remastered in 2014, and a new expansion pack was released in 2016. For the purposes of this video, I decided to use the remaster as a source for all of my footage, just because it's way more convenient. However, you should know that this video assumes the gameplay of the original release. None of the changes or additions in the remaster are discussed here, and I've actually done my best to avoid including footage of anything that wasn't part of the original release. Coming from Age of Empires 2, the biggest change I observed when I first played the game was a reorganization of the playable civilizations. Age of Empires 2 launched with 13 unique races. This was expanded to 18 with the Conqueror's expansion. Each race featured a unique unit and unique racial bonuses, in addition to a custom version of the game's tech tree. That last one is the important thing to think about. While each race had a unique take on which upgrades it could research, there were a lot more commonalities than there were differences. Civilizations branched off of a common base instead of starting out from different vantage points. There's actually quite a lot more I'd like to say about that, but I'll save it for the video on Age of Empires 2. The point I want to hammer home is this notion of a game-wide technology tree. Age of Mythology took a different approach, choosing instead to create vastly different cultures that served as the bases for the game's races. You had the Norse with Thor, Odin, and Loki, the Greeks with Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, and the Egyptians with Isis, Ra, and Set. Civilizations within a culture shared a lot in common, like minor gods, production and building mechanics, and favor gathering mechanisms. But the cultures played very differently from one another. For example, the Norse constructed all of their buildings with infantry, while the Egyptians used gold for the construction of many of their buildings. This was really interesting in competitive play, because while it seems like a trade-off on paper, it doesn't actually work out that way in practice. By allowing players to focus on two resources instead of three, at least at the start of the game, the Egyptian economy paired well with the fast heroic meta that would go on to dominate the game's competitive play. The choice to create multiple cultures instead of a single common base was an ambitious decision from the development team. While each individual race was more focused than any single race in Age of Empires 2, the game as a whole featured more unique mechanics. Ambition and a desire to do something big were something of a theme in Age of Mythology. Ian Fisher, the game's lead designer, had this to say when discussing the title's overall scope. The thing that's unique about Age of Mythology for us is that usually when you're doing a game you pick one or two things that are going to be your back-of-the-box feature items, and uh, on Age of Mythology it ended up that just every single part of the game that we wanted to do was a back-of-the-box feature item. We have a whole new multiplayer, a whole new engine, the look of the game, the gameplay that we wanted to get in, god powers, just everything turned out to be a huge raising the bar trying to knock one out of the park effort for us. In Age of Empires, we... I definitely agree that the notion of culture has inspired the imagination. Before the game was released, Ensemble conducted an online beta test with thousands of players. Back then, it wasn't easy to share video footage. To work around this, the popular fan sites ran feature items called War Stories, in which beta players would describe the games they played from beginning to end. Reading about Egyptian spearmen or Greek hoplites got me really excited for the game. It felt like Ensemble had taken the Age series to the next level in terms of creativity and vision. In terms of the actual execution of three separate cultures, my feelings are a bit more mixed. 
One of the things I appreciated about Age of Empires 2 was the sheer variety of gameplay. Units, technologies, maps, build orders, and so forth. This was relatively easy to achieve for the developers because civilizations shared a lot in common. You could build out a new idea and immediately apply it to every race in the game. Age of Mythology split its core gameplay mechanics across three distinct cultures. This meant new features could only be developed for a third of the game's races. Practically nothing was shared across cultures save for the game's fundamental UI. This reduced the breadth of gameplay available to any single race. Basically, there are only so many combinations of units and technologies you can pursue before you've exhausted the game's potential. You can see this a bit better by doing a direct comparison between the two games. Here I've selected Norse, my favorite culture from Age of Mythology, with a civilization I picked randomly from Age of Empires II, the Byzantines. I'll start with unit variety. In the second age of the game, the Norse have access to four land units and one naval unit. The Byzantines have access to five land units and three naval units. In the Third Age, the Norse get two additional units from the Hillfort, plus a new siege unit. The Byzantines get five additional units, plus four additional siege units. In the Fourth Age, the Norse get access to just a single new siege unit, while the Byzantines get a whole basket of role-specific pieces. Hand cannoneers, trebuchets, bombard cannons, and a new type of ship. If you include mythological units, you do get a bit more variety, but it's worth noting that these were never intended to be the bulk of a player's army. To put this another way, mythological units tended to be role-specific units, something we'll discuss in detail later on. This is particularly true in the case of the Norse, who need to win battles in order to generate favor. It's literally impossible to cater a build to a specific myth unit composition outside of doing a Loki rush. Next, let's talk about technology. Not including unit upgrades like medium infantry, the Norse have around 45 upgrades, while the Byzantines have around 60. Note that because the Byzantines have more units, including unit upgrades would only make the gap larger. In total, there's simply a lot more content available to a single race in Age of Empires II than there was in Age of Mythology. By my count, roughly double the number of units in all three of land, naval, and siege categories. This enabled players to mix and match dozens of different units across a huge variety of builds. Age of Mythology featured the same amount of variety in aggregate, possibly even more but it split it across three different cultures instead of reusing things across most or all of the races. This resulted in a more streamlined experience and a sense that there was simply less to do in any given game relative to its predecessor. The decrease in overall variety was complemented by an overall smaller scale to the gameplay. Age of Mythology capped its one town center population to 115. Additional town centers could only be built on pre-existing settlements. Players generally only got about three of these on their side of the map, including the one they started with. In practice, this meant that the population in most games was capped to 160, 20% smaller than the 200 of Age of Empires 2. I don't know exactly why they did it this way, but I would guess it partly had to do with technical limitations. It's worth noting that Blizzard's first 3D game, Warcraft 3, also emphasized a much smaller number of units than its sister game StarCraft. Watching the developer commentary on the game, it's really striking how much cost the new 3D engine imposed on the developers. The ambition and work that went into developing it are emphasized over and over and over. The limitation on town centers also limited the overall sprawl of the game. Players' empires simply didn't spread across the map the way they did in Age of Empires 2. The 80 to 100 villager booms of Age of Empires 2 gave way to much smaller and more focused economies. This was complemented by other simplifications. Players only needed 10 houses per game instead of dozens, and there were generally fewer production buildings to manage. Finally, the map generator accommodated all this by producing smaller and tighter maps. All of these factors worked in combination to yet again make the game feel smaller and less filled with content than its predecessor. I want to emphasize that I'm not trying to criticize the game. Plenty of people, myself included, enjoyed countless hours of random map skirmishes with the computer AI. What I'm trying to understand, in retrospect, is why Age of Mythology didn't catch fire the same way Age of Empires 2 did. The online component rapidly depopulated after launch, with thousands of concurrent players dwindling down to just a couple hundred after a few months. It's not to say there weren't mitigating factors. The rise of Warcraft 3 is a big one, as is the overall decline of the PC market in the early 2000s. But I think there's more to it than just market circumstances. I think people enjoyed the Age of Empires series in part because of the real sense of building a sprawling and massive empire. Age of Mythology just didn't quite nail that piece of the puzzle. 
the lack of unit and technology diversity, the decrease in scope of individual matches, and the overall smaller sprawl of the game are all a big part of this. To this day, mythology is roughly 10 times less popular than Age of Empires 2. Age of Mythology was an ambitious title that tried to do a lot of things all at once. One place where this philosophy succeeded was the competitive multiplayer. That's the focus for the next part of our video. In this next section, I'd like to dive deeper into some of the game's mechanics. In particular, I'd like to talk about how they impacted the competitive scene. I'm also going to focus on what I personally find interesting, so if I've omitted your favorite part of the game, my apologies in advance. The first thing I found interesting were the changes to map layout and size. Mythology featured smaller maps than its predecessor. Most races in a 1 vs 1 game could scout the entire map before reaching the second age. A big contributor to this was the relative strength of sheep scouting. While maps got smaller, they featured as many or more sheep than Age of Empires 2. In practice, this meant that players could scout almost their entire half of the map using just sheep. Better early game scouting and overall smaller maps enabled harassment to be a playstyle in and of itself. Back in the day, we called this raiding, with Odin and Poseidon being particularly skilled at it. Armies could move across small maps quickly, and players generally knew where their opponent's villagers would likely be. This allowed good players to run two or even three simultaneous harassment parties on different parts of the map. The incentive around aggression paired nicely with the overall faster pace of the game. Mythology halved the amount of time players spend in the first age, from around 10 minutes to around 5 minutes. The famous Isis Fast Heroic build would hit the third age around the 8 minute mark. At that point in Age of Empires 2, you'd probably still be in the first age. Some of the most famous builds in Age of Mythology were early game rushes. Loki rushes with mass hersers to spawn lots of myth units, Kronos rushes that were absolutely devastating when Titans first came out, and hoplite minotaur rushes from Zeus that would simply overwhelm the opponent. I suspect that these factors contributed to the designer's decision to beef up early game defenses. Town centers in mythology fired back at opponents even without garrisoning villagers. Players also started the game with four free watchtowers, although these had to be upgraded to be useful for the Norse and Greeks. The combination of faster, more aggressive gameplay combined with more defensive capabilities was a surprisingly balanced meta. You had players like me who liked to play aggressively with Odin's raiders and could make that work. You also had players who focused on tech-heavy builds with Isis or Ra. You had fast heroic Thor players, turtling Hades players, and Zeus economic boomers. Even at the height of Set's dominance in light vanilla, you still had players like Salska playing at the very highest levels with Norse. Relative to what came afterward in Age of Empires 3, Age of Mythology featured more diversity at the peak of its competitive meta. It's not to say that there wasn't a meta civilization. All top players played the most powerful race in every tournament. The point is that it wasn't strictly necessary to play the meta civilization in order to climb the ladder, in the same way that it was to play the Ottomans, Dutch, or Japanese in Age of Empires 3. Three cultures were simply easier to balance than more than a dozen civilizations. The smaller scope of the game also made it easier to get things right. Another highly underappreciated aspect to Mythology's competitive play was its unique and innovative map design. On top of old classics like Mediterranean and Ghost Lake, Mythology brought in several creative additions. Anatolia introduced a coin flip mechanic around water expansion. If you and your opponent expanded to the same side, it created an entirely different kind of game than if you picked different sides. Midgard is another good one. Deciding how much to commit to the water versus the land was a crucial strategic decision that changed game by game. I was also always a big fan of Alfheim, Savannah, and Watering Hole. Each had unique hooks that made them feel more interesting than just a standard competitive map. When the Titans was released just a year after Age of Mythology, many players were excited to see how it would expand on the game's competitive design. Age of Mythology didn't feature the largest competitive scene, but there was still a dedicated fanbase with lots of activity at the top of the ladder. Top ratings near the end of vanilla hovered around 2400, comparable to Age of Empires 2 and indicating a healthy community given the 1600 based ELO rating system. Unfortunately, I would argue that the expansion pack would go on to hurt the competitive scene in two substantial ways. One was the inclusion of the Atlanteans, who were both comically overpowered and very easy to play at launch. The 330 Kronos Rush is probably the most infamous build of this era. 
Even after they were nerfed, Oranos continued to be one of the meta races. I can't even remember how many Isis vs Oranos games I played before I quit the game entirely. The second issue was more subtle, but arguably much more impactful. The Titans added an auto queue button that enabled players to automatically construct units one after another. This was a really substantial change to the game's macro management. Vanilla Age of Mythology didn't feature many of the interface niceties that we associate with modern RTS games. Macro management featured a huge skill ceiling. Players needed to carefully and efficiently divide their attention between micro and macro. One of my favorite types of games were Odin vs Poseidon Raiding Wars, with both players furiously microing their cavalry while macroing up to 115 population and the Heroic Age. I'd argue the inclusion of AutoQue is part of Ensemble's accessibility vision. Here's Julie Swanson, the UI designer on Age of Mythology, describing the company's approach. We want Age of Mythology to be accessible to everyone, whether they're a gamer or not a gamer, no matter how much experience they have. So we take the game and we put it in front The trouble, from my perspective, is that AutoQ went a bit too far. It basically eliminated the macro management aspect of the game. This was frustrating to higher level players because it removed a key strategic element to the game, how to divide your attention and what to focus on in any given moment. Many novice players confuse macro management with mindless clicking, but this is a misunderstanding. Dividing your attention and deciding what to prioritize are important strategic decisions. By getting rid of them, Ensemble removed not just a core component of the skill ceiling, but also an integral part of the fun and enjoyment of playing the title competitively. A more subtle issue with AutoCue is the way it made balance problems much worse. In Vanilla Age of Mythology, the skill ceiling was high enough that a good player had room to micro or macro their way out of unbalanced situations. Obviously there were limits to this, with practically every player at the 2003 World Cyber Games selecting Set as their main race. But in general, a good player could take practically any race in the game and climb straight to the top of the ladder. AutoCue enabled perfect macro management, meaning races whose units were slightly stronger could always outplay races whose units were slightly weaker. In other words, if you were playing Isis and I was playing Odin, in vanilla Age of Mythology I could get a ton of mileage from microing multiple raiding parties while simultaneously out macroing you to 115 population. But in Titans that skill ceiling was taken away, reducing the game mostly to a micromanagement contest and ensuring that Isis's superior units and economy would practically always win. It's not an exaggeration to say that this one feature substantially influenced my perspective on the design of real-time strategy games. Back in the Conquerors, there was a big controversy over automatically reseeding farms. Similar to today's debates about mechanics, there was a faction arguing that it was a quality of life feature, and a faction arguing it was lowering the game's skill ceiling and ultimately making it less interesting. I never really understood the second faction until I experienced AutoCue. It goes beyond simplifying the user interface. Quality of life features have the potential to completely change how a game is played and make otherwise hidden problems suddenly super visible. I dislike the feature so much that I refuse to use it in competitive play. Many other players simply quit the game entirely, with the top rating on the ladder declining to around 2000. In this next section I'd like to talk a bit about mythological units and god powers. Age of Mythology removed the stone resource from Age of Empires 2 and replaced it with Favor. Favor was used to construct mythological units and research a variety of upgrades. Each culture generated favor differently, the Norse through combat, the Egyptians through monuments, and the Greeks through villagers praying at the temple. Mythological units played an interesting role in the game's combat system. Age of Mythology leveraged a fairly hard counter system in which each unit had clear pros and cons. Throwing axemen were good against infantry, but weak against archers and cavalry. Cavalry savaged ranged units, but died quickly to spearmen. Spearmen got mowed down by anti-infantry. Mythological units sat adjacent to this system, generally outperforming all varieties of normal units but getting hard countered by hero units. Myth units also often punched above their weight relative to their stats. They often performed specific roles and complemented specific playstyles. For example, Valkyrie healing was an integral part to Odin's raiding strategy, enabling players to take risks, play aggressively, and still trade cost efficiently. The Minotaur is another good example, playing a key role in Zeus's hoplite rushes by taking damage and destroying buildings. Some of my strongest memories from Age of Mythology stem from the use of myth units. I think this is in part because each myth unit had a special ability that gave them more impact in combat. 
I can literally hear the sound of the Enherjar horn or a Battlemore buck just by thinking about it. The instant kill of the mummy is also particularly memorable. I can't immediately recall what it sounds like, but I can see it on the battlefield like it was just yesterday. Next up, let's talk about god powers. The god power system was touted heavily by Ensemble prior to release. It was a keystone feature of the title, and a major differentiator from the more classic gameplay of Age of Empires 2. Overall, I like the way the god power system worked. Heimdall's Underbite and Bragi's Flaming Weapons are two examples of god powers that I can hear in my head just by thinking about them. Because god powers could only be used once per game, they were typically used to proactively accompany timings or rushes. More reactive powers like Ceasefire were generally not as useful as ones that could actively be leveraged to strengthen an already strong strategy. The god powers did have a flaw in the sense they don't seem to have worked out the way the designers intended. They were definitely a cool mechanic, but they weren't integral to the gameplay in the way they were pitched. The core problem from my perspective is the trade-off between impact and balance. The stronger a god power, the harder it would be to balance, and the more likely it would become a one-dimensional gimmick. By contrast, the weaker a god power, the less it would feel like an actual power an actual god would have. It's hard to be both impactful and balanced. Mythology's middle-of-the-road approach worked out pretty well in the end, but it wasn't the series-changing paradigm shift that pre-release interviews seemed to imply. I would actually argue that the home city system Age of Empires 3 was a refined version of mythology's god powers. By splitting them into smaller chunks and allowing players to select many over the course of the game, Shipments were easier to balance and played an overall larger role in the title than God Powers did for mythology. In this next section, I'd like to talk about graphics and sound. The keystone new graphical feature in Age of Mythology, aside from its brand new three dimensional engine, were its cinematic cutscenes in the single player campaign. These were quite impressive and brought the player directly from a cinematic into the gameplay. For me personally, this new feature went underappreciated because Warcraft 3 did the same thing just a few months earlier. It's a bit of a shame because it's obvious from the developer commentary just how much work went into this. Another substantial interface change was the elimination of the explicit grid used in Age of Empires 2. Now obviously there's still a grid under the covers because there's only so many XY coordinates on the map. However, Age of Mythology got quite close to the concept of freeform building placement, and it's something of a treat to play the game after getting accustomed to the grid of a game like StarCraft II. You really feel like you can place buildings anywhere on the map, and construct exactly the kind of empire you want. The three-dimensional engine was also a substantial change from a gameplay perspective. Age of Mythology retains the isometric view of most real-time strategy games, including Age of Empires II. What the 3D engine changes is the relationship between the camera and the items in the game world. The map is actually three-dimensional and curved. Isometric projection does a good job hiding this, but it's not a perfect solution. Here I'll illustrate with a minotaur. Notice that its size changes depending on where the camera is panned. This is because, in a 3D environment, the minotaur is literally further away from the camera in one location than it is in the other. Mythology's use of non-discrete elevation also adds additional variability here. I actually wonder whether this was intentional in order to mask the effects of the 3D engine. I've mentioned this in my other videos, but I think it's worth mentioning here as well. The shift from 2D to 3D is not a trivial one in real-time strategy. I think one of the reasons some players have a preference for 2D RTS is the subtle control issues they experience transitioning from 2D to 3D. It's subtle, but it very much hits upon your sense of accuracy as you click around the map. If you don't take the time to get accustomed to it, it's easy to get turned off by it. Next up, let's talk about sound design. There's no other way to describe it. Age of Mythology's sound design is simply iconic. I'm not exaggerating when I say it's the best part of this game. That shouldn't be too difficult to believe considering that it's also one of the best parts of Age of Empires 2. I absolutely adore the unit selection and movement sound effects. Here are some examples for the Norse and Greeks. The soundtrack is similarly sublime. The shift away from synthesizers in favor of real instruments and a live orchestra gives the sound a sense of authenticity and vibrancy. I just love it. Here's a segment of one of my favorite tracks. Something. 
Age of Mythology was a big and bold shift from Age of Empires 2. The gameplay shifted dramatically, with faster pacing, smaller maps, and a focus on smaller economies and more tech-heavy builds. God powers and mythological units were keystone features that made a big impact on the gameplay, once again emphasizing timings and sharp strategies over the sprawl and variety of mythology's predecessor. But Age of Mythology is more than just a spin-off game. First we need to give Ensemble some benefit of the doubt. Mythology was an extremely ambitious title. It featured a brand new online system, a brand new engine, it was Ensemble's first transition from 2D to 3D, it leveraged three cultural bases instead of one, and it added on major new systems in the form of god powers and myth units. Not everything worked out the way it was intended, but it's hard not to respect the creative risks the company took with this title. Mythology further retains the core charm of the series, and it feels right all the way through. Classics like water combat, the age-up system, the fundamental resources, even details like an initial scouting unit, an emphasis on fun over realism, the inclusion of explicit siege units to counteract turtling, and so on and so forth. While the game's pacing was substantially sped up compared to its predecessor, it was still a much more economic game than other titles on the market. In sum, Age of Mythology is a fantastic game. Ensemble really pushed the envelope with this title. You just can't help but feel their passion and dedication as you watch the developer commentary. Late nights, an insane crunch to get the thing out the door. Age of Mythology is an iconic RTS game, and it stands tall within the Age of Empires family. Alrighty, that's everything I had for today. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, I'd love it if you followed me here and on Twitter and Facebook to receive regular content updates. The relevant links are in the description below. All the best, and see you next time.